All right, it is 10.05 a.m. So I think we've waited enough on Berkeley time here. Um, Max and Circus are probably not used to that. So <laughs> um, welcome um, and hi, Bill. Nice to see you. Hey, everybody. Hey, Kara, thanks for uh, hosting this. And thank you to Max and Circus. Uh, so I'll let you continue, Kara. Good to see you. Yeah. Everybody. Great. Um, so we'll be, we'll begin right away. Um, well, today we are joined by our colleagues, Max and Sarkis from UC Irvine, who will give a presentation and demo of Zot GPT, which is a chat tool that they've built upon um, atop Azure AI that currently provides no cost access to GPT-4 Turbo to their faculty, staff, and students. And so um, I just want to introduce Max Garrick, Assistant Director of Executive Application Support at the UC Irvine's Office of Information Technology, and Sarkis Daglian, Director of Client Services at UC Irvine's Office of Information Technology. And um, take it away, Max and Sarkis. Welcome. Thank you so much, and thank you for the opportunity to present on Zot GPT in front of this audience. Um, I, for one, appreciate Berkeley time as someone who habitually runs a few minutes late, so no problem. Uh, so Max and I are here to uh, demo and talk about the roadmap and our experience in launching Zot GPT chat to our campus, um, which has been a winding, uh, challenging road for us, but we've achieved it, so we're, we're very proud of that. Uh, so just a little bit about why we're doing this, uh, Pew Research has shown that 23% of all Americans have used ChatGPT. Um, unsurprisingly, this skews uh, much more heavily to younger adults. 43% uh, of adults under 30 have used uh, ChatGPT. Um, ChatGPT is actually uh, the fastest online platform in history to reach 100 million users, reach that feed in two months. That's faster than Instagram, Facebook, any of the major social media platforms that we can think of. Um, Educause ran a uh, survey of stakeholders in higher ed um, and found that 83% believe that it will uh, change profoundly how we uh, approach higher education in the next three to five years. Um, Gardner says that by 2026, 25% of traditional search traffic to sites like Google and Yahoo uh, will be uh, diverted over to generative AI. Uh, and the market for artificial intelligence is exploding. Oh, it was a $200 billion market cap. Um, in 2023 and expected to hit 1.8 trillion by 2030. Um, our common use cases, obviously, are image generation, document summary, and chatbots. Uh, I always throw this UC Irvine uh, image generated and eater on this slide because at UCI, we always encourage everyone to think of AI as an assistant that does make mistakes uh, and you should always verify what it tells you. Uh, so our launch was on January 10th, the faculty and staff uh, we launched three services concurrently. We launched ZotGPT Chat, which is our own homegrown solution. Uh, we also launched Microsoft Copilot and Google Gemini. Uh, since this time, we've also added uh, Zoom AI to our portfolio of solutions. And we're also doing a partnership study between OIT and our Palmer Ross School of Business on Office 365 Copilot, uh, which we can talk about a little later. Uh, our email to campus, uh, all campus faculty and staff, was the most successful outreach in our organization's history. Uh, we're usually fortunate to get a 10% open rate on emails that get sent to all campus. Um, and on this one, uh, and I thought this was a mistake, I actually verified this, we had 131% open rate. Uh, this email was opened twice and clicked through by more individuals on campus than in all of OIT's history. Uh, we are launching to our students tomorrow, which we're very excited about, uh, a very long road to get there that I'll talk about here uh, on my next slide. So how did we approach launch? Uh, Max and I's original idea was to launch to everyone on campus, including our students. Back in January, uh, we faced resistance. Uh, we faced concerns from teaching and learning. Um, we had conversations on campus about whether or not generative AI calls, you know, how that interact with academic honesty. Um, we also learned of capacity issues we would have had with our solution had we launched uh, in January. Uh, so we went on a lengthy adventure to talk to all the relevant stakeholders on campus at UC Irvine to get buy-in. Um, and, and we quickly discovered that uh, with no centralized AI governance body, um, speaking to academic senate uh, work groups, uh, there were no AI academic senate work groups and the ones uh, to form one would take too long, and the ones that do exist would operate uh, too slowly 
to respond uh, quickly enough to the rapid uh, changing landscape of AI. Uh, so after many conversations with our vice chancellor and other leadership on campus, the path of least resistance was to launch the faculty and staff first. Uh, this allowed our faculty to get at least a quarter head start on uh, looking into what the capabilities were of the AI solutions we were providing. Um, and it also gave staff an opportunity to uh, have a chance to uh, work with the tools and apply it into ways in which that would be beneficial to their daily work. Uh, from there, Max and I began navigating uh, many conversations around teaching and learning, including academic integrity. Uh, and we framed a lot of these conversations around uh, a couple of various points. Uh, we have talked to undergraduate students on campus and a lot of them were using generative AI unofficially outside of um, our supported tools. That means that university data, whether that's instructional, research, et cetera, was being put into retail models and being used to train retail models on, on what is proprietary faculty data, uh, which is not something that we wanted to have happen. Um, there's also an equity of access issue for us on campus. Uh, students that have the means to pay $20 a month times n number of premium AI services had access to the best models and the best information. Um, and lastly, around um, hallucinations, we had to we had to have conversations around. Um, well, AI hallucinates and doesn't give you accurate information. Um, AI LLMs are built off of information that's available online. Uh, those of us who remember when the internet first exploded remember a lot of those same conversations happening about can you trust everything you read online? I think the answer is obviously no. Uh, we had a lot of privacy and legal discussions. Uh, there was a point at which early on in the process, we felt that we were trying to craft the perfect policy and guidelines around security and privacy. Uh, we quickly discovered that given the very young st uh, stage of the, of the platforms, um, there's a lot of questions that we don't have the perfect answer to and neither does industry. Uh, and so for us in, in conversations with our vice chancellor, privacy and legal were positioned as advisory in an advisory capacity and not anything that was binding to us. Um, that's not to say we went off and made decisions um, that were irresponsible, but um, we didn't want to let having something that was absolutely perfect and answered every edge case and answered every what if be the enemy of us being able to craft policies and user guidelines that were good enough um, that would prevent that and allowed us to launch the product. Uh, so over the last five to six months or so, Max and I have been on a grassroots outreach campaign. Uh, we've had 20 plus conversations with various campus groups across administration, um, various academic schools. These, these conversations continue. Uh, we've collaboratively joined other uh, artificial intelligence subgroups around campus. So for example, we sit as members of the uh, Office of Vice Provost for Teaching and Learning AI advisory group. Uh, we are joining the uh, AI subgroup within the Division of Finance and Administration. Um, and we continue to, as uh, individuals around campus, reach out to us, join ideation sessions, do demonstrations like this one um, as an ongoing process to get the campus accustomed to the tools that we have available and responsible AI use. Uh, this is all culminated in something that Max and I are very proud of. Uh, our, our work group was a work group of individuals uh, putting in the time uh, out of their own interest as additional roles to their day jobs. Uh, as such, uh, our campus has decided to strategically uh, fund the beginnings of a dedicated Gen AI team. Uh, we are opening this team up with uh, four initial positions, uh, two developers, uh, one business systems analyst, uh, one cloud administrator. Uh, we also have part-time contributions that will continue from our UI UX folks, our communications team, and our web team. Uh, the objectives of this team will be to continue to build out the ZotGPT chat roadmap, which uh, Max will speak to. Um, the BSA will help us in our continued um, consultations and ideation sessions with units on campus about where generative AI can fit into their day-to-day -day work um, and assist with prompt engineering. And finally, the team will be responsible for white gloving um, certain projects into implementation. Um, as you'll see later, we've gotten so many use cases that even if we were given a blank check to staff up our AI team, uh, we would never be able to serve all the use cases that we've been given ourselves. Um, here's our most recent daily use count over the past 30 days. Again, this is just faculty and staff to give the, the call an idea of where we started. Uh, when we first launched ZotGPT chat, 
We had about 60 or 70 users every day. And over the last uh, few months or so, that's now grown where we're, we're hitting, you know, con consistently around 200 to over 200 users every day. And this is prior to the student launch, which we expect will uh, grow these numbers exponentially. Uh, now I'm going to stop my share and turn it over to Max to give you all a demonstration of his GPT chat along with the uh, feature sets and roadmaps. All right, thank you, Sargas. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm on the landing page for Zot GPT, um, where the first thing you'll notice is this big green banner welcoming students to Zot GPT. So tomorrow will be their first opportunity to, to uh, access Zot GPT. So they'll be coming in here. They'll be reading about, hopefully, our, our guidance on AI use, uh, academic integrity policies, and other information. And then they'll come down here to access Zot GPT chat. So a little bit more about Zot GPT chat. It supports up to P3 level data. So you can think of this as like student records, personnel records, things like that. Um, and back when we were first building this tool, there were no safe generative AI tools available for our campus community. So we knew that people were using retail versions, free versions of generative AI, potentially uh, giving it our institutional data in the, in the process. Once institutional data makes it into one of these models, it makes it very difficult to get that data back out again. So we wanted, we view this as an unacceptable risk for, for our campus. There are some security confidentiality issues that we, we really did need to resolve. So that's the motivation and Sarkis touched on that as well. Uh, we also offer a few other services, Microsoft Copilot, uh, Google Gemini, and then a uh, new service, Zoom AI, which offers meeting summaries, uh, it has an AI uh, question and answer, things like that. One of the big questions we get is, uh, how do you choose between these three different services? I'm kind of excluding Zoom and AI, but these three services, how do you choose between them? They're all very similar. And for that, we have a handy dandy comparison chart with ZotGPT chat right down the middle, uh, where you can kind of compare each one of these services and what features and capabilities they have. So we want to turn all of these X marks for ZotGPT chat into check marks in the months ahead. Uh, the months to come. Uh, but with that, I just want to go ahead and show you ZotGPT chat. So this requires a you know shibboleth, a UCN net ID login. First thing you see is that we have a privacy policy. I can talk about that uh, a little bit. And then we have an email uh, for support. I'll start a new chat. And you're asked, what kind of conversation style do you want? Do you want it to be a creative brainstorming session? So you can choose that. Do you want it to be a more analytical or precise conversation? You can choose that. I usually choose balanced. And then you can just go ahead and start chatting away with ZotGPT chat. But um, what I want to show you is the ability to upload a file and ask it questions about that file. Um, so I'm uploading the UCI strategic plan. And this just, just takes a few moments to, to process. While, while I'm waiting for that, I want to show you a little bit more about the model we have. So Sarkis mentioned we're using GPT-4 Turbo. This is the same model that's used by OpenAI, their, their paid uh, service, ChatGPT+. We're not using OpenAI's version. We're actually using it within our Microsoft, our secure Microsoft tenant. So we're taking advantage of all the security protections that we have with our, our Microsoft contract. Uh, one other thing has been updated. Um, the model has been trained on data up to December 2023, so it has no information or no knowledge about events or content that's been published after that point in time. So my file has been uploaded. I can ask it a question. How many faculty do we plan on hiring? This is a pretty easy answer for our uh, strategic plan, and it gets the answer right. 25 new Senate faculty on top of the 175 that we've already hired to date. And it gives you this link to a citation. Uh, so here you can see where in that PDF it mentioned that information. This is really important because no generative AI tool is gonna be 100% accurate. Everyone will give you an inaccurate answer once in a while. So important to check those citations. Uh, we also do have a conversation history here. So if you wanna go back to a previous conversation, uh, very similar to ChatGPT, you've used that. And then one last feature I want to uh, show this microphone button. If you hold this down, you can talk to Zot GPT chat and it will talk back to you, which is pretty mind bending if you've never had a conversation with AI before. So that is um, Zot GPT in a nutshell, but I want to show you where we're planning on going in the months 
to come. Let's get to the right spot here. So this is our simplified roadmap. So uh, Sarkis mentioned we launched in January to staff and faculty. Since then, we've upgraded our underlying model. Uh, the, a model is like the AI brain behind ZotGPT chat. We uh, are offering a selection of models. So right now we only have two to choose from, but we hope to expand that in the future. Number of accessibility, usability improvements. Um, we posted a privacy policy, which is really important for reassuring our campus community that the data that they put into this tool is kept safe and it's kept private to the, their conversation. Um, so this is important. Like we didn't want people to think that we we're going to train a model on on their data or share it with with random people. So this privacy policy is important. And then we also expanded capacity, like uh, Sarkis mentioned, because we're preparing for an influx of new new users because we're expanding the students um, tomorrow. And uh, Sarkis mentioned the reason why. So the main one of the big ones is equity of access. So we know that students are using generative AI tools to help them learn. Uh, they're even paying for it in some pay, in some cases. We uh, view that as an equity of access issue. Uh, we do want every student on campus to have access to the very best models through ZotGPT chat. So we will have achieved that goal uh, tomorrow. Next is image generation, where we want to give everybody the power to generate their own robotic anteaters, just like this. And then following that is internet search, giving ZotGPT chat the power to search the internet pull back more up-to-date information, hopefully plug that knowledge gap that I mentioned earlier. Some other features uh, after that or a little bit further down the road, we're just gonna talk about a couple of these, uh, starting with the Gilman Copilot. This name is still pending. We have to come up with a good name for it. But our chancellor, Chancellor Gilman, he teaches a class called Introduction to Free Speech and Academic Freedom. So we're building a chat bot for, for him it's going to be trained on his writings, uh, his course materials, and other other notes, and we're going to be offering this to his his students. So hopefully, it will answer any question that his students may have. We'll, we'll see how how well it does. So we want to get that ready in time for his next course. That he's going to be teaching. Next is API access. We have a number of researchers wanting access to ZotGPT's underlying API, so that they can build their own uh, AI powered applications and research projects on top of it. So that's really exciting. We hope to offer that soon. And then customer service chatbots is the last thing I'll mention here. Uh, this is um, this is like a chatbot that lives on your web page. You've probably seen them in, in many websites. It's a little icon on the bottom right corner of a website. Sometimes it pops up and it says, hey, you know, do you have a question? Uh, so that you can train them to have their own personality. You can give them custom instructions on how to respond to specific questions. You can even give it access to collection of documents to inform its answers. And we also want to, to uh, set it loose on, on websites as well to pull in all of that website content to use as a repository for informing its answers. So a lot of uh, utility here. A number of units are interested in that, uh, that capability. A few ideas that we've heard, uh, Sar Sarkis and I had met with something like 20 plus units uh, or yeah, units across campus. And one thing that we've learned is that people have really great ideas for applying AI to the work that they do. These are just a, a sample of them. Uh, so these are just ideas that are not supported by ZotGPT yet. The idea here is that we have a lot of documentation in the form of policies and guidelines and things like that. that people put a lot of time and effort into. Can we leverage those, build a bot around them uh, to help people in their work? So the first example is this policy bot where you can imagine you have a, an assistant professor getting ready to have a child. Uh, they wanna know how that impacts their upcoming merit or their tenure review, right? We have a whole policy on this. The policy bot can guide them through that process and then ultimately connect them to the right person at their campus to, to discuss further. JDBot is another example where I'm sure a number of you have, have written your own job description, career tracks job descriptions. Wouldn't it be great to have a bot to help you through that process? Uh, to come up with a HR compliant job description and maybe save you some time in the process. And then uh, another example down there, budget bot. So a lot of ideas. Some of these ideas are further along than others. Uh, these have proof of concepts that don't, aren't publicly available yet. These are related to faculty research. So taking information that we have on campus in the form of grant information, publications, to answer questions like what faculty have expertise in grief or batteries or whatever um, area of expertise. 
So this could be really helpful for somebody outside of our university wanting to find somebody at UCI to potentially collaborate with, right? And then another example down here about grants um, could also be useful. The last proof of concept I'll mention is Scholar Connect. This is something that we're, we're spinning up now. Question we're trying to answer with this pilot is, can we leverage the data we already have on campus to help people learn about our faculty, their research, their honors and awards, and to potentially connect with them? So the idea is that every faculty member has a CV. Of course, they keep it up to date relatively. At UCI, we store all of these CVs in our new faculty merit and promotion system called Scholar Steps. We will be feeding those CVs into Scholar Connect, which leverages generative AI and other technologies to essentially turn that PDF into data, right? Data like what's their current position, what are their degrees, what it would scour the CV for honors and awards information, potentially summarize research interests, pull out publication data. So once we have this data, we can turn it into things like um, a simple faculty profile for the faculty member. And because at our campus, at least, every faculty member has to keep that CV up to date every three years for the merit promotion process. That's a great opportunity to keep this faculty profile up to date by running it through this process every three years. We can also service honors and awards information, and we can power that search engine that I just uh, talked about in the previous slide. This is my last slide. Um, so chatbots, chatbots are everywhere at UCI. They seem to be spreading every day. Here's just a couple examples. We have one from admissions and financial aid, and then another one from student affairs. These are both powered by a product called Gecko. They're offered to students and prospective students, answering you know hopefully all their questions. They can answer questions after hours when our staff go home. They can answer a number of routine questions, hopefully taking a lot of that workload off of those those offices. So uh, really, a lot of opportunity here and a lot of interest from our campus. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Sarkis. You just go to the last slide, Max. Sure. Yeah, so as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we also have Author365 Copilot available on campus. Uh, we're running a study with our Palm Royal School of Business to see how um, attitudes and efficiencies change uh, in a group that does not have access to Copilot with one that does. Uh, the Zoom AI companion is also turned on for campus, um, albeit silently, but it does a lot of the same um, things as the Teams Copilot with uh, meeting transcripts, chat summary, and smart recordings. Um, and lastly, we do imminently expect the ChatGPT system-wide negotiation to conclude, um, which will allow us to, on a case-by-case -case basis, provision uh, ChatGPT enterprise licenses to our campus. And with that, thank you. We'll go ahead and start opening up for questions. Thank you, Max and Sarkis. Such an interesting presentation and ha our community having also heard from UCSD about Triton GPT. I think the model that they um, have followed and the trajectory they have followed is quite different <laughs> than what you have followed at UCI. Maybe similar, more a little bit more similar to Berkeley style um, in kind of and and how you addressed the bottlenecks, the um, the challenges at the outset of a project and how to get past and both work with your stakeholders and your constituents on campus to get to get buy in. Um, We've got some questions. Um, Greg, go ahead. Hi, and thank you. Thank you both for sharing. This is this is really cool. I have a quick question. Um, uh, 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 you all used the word training uh, several times about training the model, and and I, I wonder if you're literally retraining and redeploying, or are you just putting you know documents doing rag and indexing in front of your model? It's it's the latter. Yeah, you're right. Uh, we use the the term training. We've given this this presentation to a number of different audiences, and and we do use the term training just because it's the most accessible. Yeah. Thank you. There was also questions in chat about um, cost and what's that costing. So, uh, just a quick, like one you know thirty second elevator talk on this. When we originally launched ZotGPD chat to students, we were using Azure's pay as you go model. We were incurring about thousand to two thousand dollars a month at most in our Azure costs, and our our token per minute limit was it was low. I want to say something like. 60 or 80,000, somewhere in that neighborhood. Had we launched to students in that model, we would have crashed ZotGPT chat uh, immediately. 
So we, we had conversations with Microsoft around this when they when they had learned that we were planning to launch the students um, that encouraged us to purchase a, a PTU. Um, and what a PTU is, it's your own dedicated lane in the in the Azure OpenAI infrastructure. And um, it comes with a tune of $31,200 a month, but it gives us uh, access to, uh, I wanna say 400,000 tokens per minute. Um, we're not sure that itself will even be enough to hold our students, but it at least provides us um, cost control and provides us uh, a much faster experience and uh, lastly, I, I forgot which university it was, but some university launched without any sort of budgeting control in place like this and, and was able to rack up, I, I think, a six-digit bill in the course of the day. I forgot who that was. But um, using the PTU model, it does give us some cost control. It does give us predictability over, over our usage. Um, and so that we're thankful. It's really a, a pilot for us. We're, we're using this first month. It's a month-to-month -month subscription. So we're using this first month as an investment to see what is our actual usage and if we want to continue to use it. So. Thanks, Circus. Amina, you had a question in the com in the chat about that conversation style and how that is being set. Do you want to ask that? Sure, yeah. I just had a quick question about the, the conversation style parameter and um, if that's something that's either being like trained in the prompt or is that just using like the, the temperature variable and the API calls that it's made to the Azure Open AI? It's, it's just the temperature. Yeah, so we're adjusting that higher uh, temperature will be higher for more creative and lower for more precise. Yep. Well, thank you. Welcome. Max, there was a question in chat about um, availability to other campuses. We made the source code, uh, the source code available um, to others who'd like to deploy. Do you want to say any words about that? Sure. Yeah, we, we uh, right now we're hosting it on our internal GitHub enterprise. So it's a little bit harder to give people access, but there, we absolutely do want to give, you know, other UC campuses access. We uploaded it to um, UCLA's Confluence Wiki. I think that it's, everybody should have access to, to that. It's a UC system-wide accessible Wiki. Um, we, we probably need to update it because we've, we've implemented a number of enhancements, but it's essentially just like a zip file that we've uploaded there, but we want to get, you know, a better way to share this code with others. So if you're interested in downloading that, checking it out, or if you'd like to reach out to us on like how to get it set up, you know, in your own environment, we'd be happy to have a, a conversation with you. There's a few other questions. Uh, what do we anticipate students? How they? How will students use this tool? What? How do you anticipate their usage? I'm kind of interested in that too. <laughs> but we know that a lot of instructors, uh, they do incorporate generative AI into their courses. They embed it into their syllabus. We know that that will increase once we offer ZotGPT chat for students because there'll be a real clear resource that, that students can use. So people are using it in their, their classrooms. We've seen um, a few pilot projects, one called Papyrus AI. Maybe we can talk about that here. Papyrus AI, which is built by a few researchers at our campus. It leverages the same kind of underlying API, or we, it will soon uh, we leveraged ZotGPT's API. And uh, they, they're gonna be offering it to, they did a pilot for one creative writing course where all their students had access to it. And it essentially um, is programmed with a bunch of prompts. Stu the instructor has a lot of uh, control over, you know, the guardrails and the prompts that are used. And then student, it essentially guides students through their creative writing assignments. Um, and instructors have access, full access to conversation histories for, for students. So that's just one example of kind of a creative use within the classroom, but I imagine that they will be, students will be using it for, for a whole variety of things. I don't know, Sarkis, did you have anything else to add? <laughs> uh, no, I think that's, that's um, that, was, that was a good summary. Yeah. Uh, question, there was a question in the chat with regards to training when we're, when we're training it on documents. Is that being done? Um, there's a question on RAG. Are we literally training the new model um, for each app or RAG document indexing in front of the LLM endpoint? Yeah, I think we we covered that one. Okay. So it, it is just RAG, just RAG. Uh, we're not actually training the models. Training models, as many of you probably know, is very labor and cost intensive. So yeah, we're not we are not training models. Uh, somebody asked in chat, how long is it going to take for AI to fully replace the working force? Uh, from our perspective, as of this moment in time, uh, without a crystal ball, 
and Max and I faced this question a lot in the early days of the discussion. Um, we we view it as those will be those who know how to, how to use generative AI will be at an advantage versus those who do not, as opposed to generative AI is at a point where it can just replace you. Now, I don't want to say that there's a non-zero chance of that happening in the future. I definitely think that would be misleading. There, there definitely is a chance of that happening, but for the time being, um, we we view it as an essential skill set to have, just like you would look at being able to use the web or the internet or or you know email as an essential skill set, you know office essential technical skill sets that we assume um, everyone in IT to have. Um, additionally, for us, when we thought about it, just at a at a broader scope on campus, um, you know, as a university system, our products are our students. Uh, when our students graduate and they go to the marketplace. Um, it's the onus is on us to provide them the opportunities to give them the best chance to succeed in the marketplace and uh, making Gen AI available to them, uh, building up upskilling opportunities, which is something that we'll be working on in the coming months, uh, we think puts uh, makes UCI more attractive and gives our students a better opportunity once they enter the job uh, labor market and being able to say on their job applications, um, yes, I'm you know, familiar with how to use generative AI. I've you know, thought of these use cases um, and as we incorporate that more, hopefully in the next 12 months, as I knock on wood into our instruction, uh, we'll start seeing that more and more on our campus. There's a question for- could, could you just talk a little bit more about the upskilling opportunities that you're providing and what that, what that, what that looks like? So they're in dev right now. So they're in development. Uh, it's currently a joint venture between ourselves, our vice chancellor's office of Office of Continuing Ed, um, our division of undergraduate education. Um, there's no real template on how to, how to train up someone on AI usage. Uh, I know Udemy, which is a tool that we have on campus, has a, has a long, um, very extensive course listing on AI. Uh, however, I think we're looking to create more targeted training materials, like aimed at a student, aimed at a faculty member, aimed at an administrator, uh, and those will have to be separate tracks that, that we develop. There's a question from Amy about um, consent. So she's referring to the Scholar Connect pilot. That's where we're taking faculty CVs and we're kind of extracting data from them. That will be um, a, we're, we're pitching it as an opt-out for faculty. So it will all be built into our scholar steps, faculty merit and promotion system. So as a faculty member uploads their, their CV and they're going through the process of being reviewed, they're asked a few questions, including like, do you certify that all of your data and your documents are accurate? We wanna put the opt-out there, um, but we're hoping that most people do kind of uh, volunteer to offer their, their CV. And then from there we can create a, a simple faculty profile that they can review and hopefully, you know, tweak it and ultimately save them some time. So hopefully that answers that question. Uh, I wanted to highlight a question from Irfan about how you are, if if so, how are you currently engaging with the daily users to see what they're using ZotGPT for and how their experience has been? So we're currently crafting our first outreach to our users. Uh, those are who are using it. Uh, a survey is going to go out to them about their experience and, and feedback they have. Uh, we've been getting feedback uh, informally and formally just through messages to, to Max and I, uh, through our ticketing system, into our support team. Uh, but yeah, our first formal outreach to the faculty and uh, faculty and staff that have been using it is uh, is about to go out in a survey form here in the next week or two. I, I can give just a few examples that we've heard through just support and other things. One is a faculty a researcher creating a nicotine cessation chatbot through ZotGPT chat, which I thought was pretty pretty cool. Another uh, math professor using it to uh, essentially running their, their draft publication through ZotGPT chat, asking it to run through the proofs and to solve some of the proofs and kind of double check some of the, the data there. So that was really interesting uh, as well. Uh, we're working with another unit that uh, we use ServiceNow for like our ticketing system. So there's lots of data in the form of like tickets in this system. They want to take all of this data, run it through ZotGPT chat, and essentially put produce a, a really great FAQ um, that they can either post on their website or they can use in their own um, AI chatbots to kind of train their own train their own AI chatbots. 
Uh, two questions I wanted to respond to in the chat, one around academic honesty and if we're using any sort of like AI detection tools if, to see if students have used AI to, to write a paper. Um, right now we found, uh, and I think this is pretty consistent with others, um, any sort of like a turnitin.com or any solution at the moment that presents itself as a we can detect AI, um, we found to the, the false positive rate to be too high for our comfort level. Um, you know, AI itself is bad at recognizing when something's been written by a human or AI. Um, our best control that we've seen on campus is the Papyrus AI project, which we think is really interesting. But but at the moment, um, there's no like surefire AI detection via like a turn it in or, or like tool. Some, some things that we've, we've tried to drive home to the faculty is uh, over the last year when ChatGPT use has exploded since 2023, we can be fairly certain that it's being used um, in, in appropriate and appropriate ways in the course of academic um, integrity, you know, integrity conversations, uh, whether we're aware of them or not, unfortunately. And it's just something that the industry itself is struggling to catch up with. Uh, another question I received from Bill was, uh, how are we handling uh, the various use cases from a solutioning standpoint between research, teaching, and learning and administration on our campus. Uh, I guess we could say in a way that we're fortunate at UCI. Um, this is just my two cents. I, I think right now campus, when it comes to the solution architecture and what to use when from a guidance perspective, the campus views uh, the OIT uh, AI work group that Max and I are co-chairing as the de facto consultation body at the moment on what they should be using. Uh, we've had several units go out and uh, pick their own solution, uh, but a lot of the conversations around, I want to do X, what should I use or how should I do this, um, are are really, I think, rerouting back to us. And so we're, we're able to help guide those conversations. Uh, the one exception is Gecko, which has been really interesting. Uh, that's been a longstanding relationship that our campus has had with that vendor before they had AI incorporation. Uh, and so several units are using them uh, they were originally used as um, just like an FAQ chatbot or someone app to go in and put in questions and answers they get back. And now that they've incorporated AI, uh, more campus units are using them to use GPT-4 to scroll their websites and answer questions. Um, Bill, Bill also asked uh, earlier, earlier on questions about like human in the loop, and especially as we're rolling out more and more of these chatbots on campus, People are going to be using these chatbots. They're going to be asking it questions. How do we know? You know, is it going to give correct answers? Like, is there anybody reviewing this? So, uh, Sarkis mentioned Gecko. Uh, Gecko is really nice in that it combines large language models, but it also has this really great administrative backend for our offices, where they can see every kind of question come in. They can review Gecko's answers, the quality. Uh, Gecko also produces a confidence score. So even it's you know Gecko itself is trying to understand like, do I really know the answer to this? Uh, so you can like search through that uh, and then their offices can reach out to students if there was like an incorrect answer or something like that, uh, they can always get in contact with those people. So definitely these tools require human in the loop for more, most purposes. Like these are students asking questions about their financial aid and stuff like that. We do want them to have the, the right answers. Maybe if there's like a no risk kind of thing out there, you wouldn't need a human in the loop. But I think for most of the stuff we do, yeah, you definitely need to review this stuff. There, there was one more question, um, more technical one, if I can sh share a brief slide as it on the technical architecture. This is a, sort of a, a high level view of the technical architecture. So this is on GPT chat that I demoed. It's based on an open source uh, repository built by Microsoft called Azure Chat. It's on github.com if you want to check that out. We've implemented a number of enhancements on top of it, like shibboleth authentication, so people can sign in, accessibility improvements, uh, model selection, a lot, lot of things like that. So this is actually hosted on AWS. Uh, and then we use Azure AI, so we're multi-cloud. <laughs> this is a multi-cloud solution. Uh, yeah, we're using Azure OpenAI. I mentioned all of this, and then for uh, doing document intelligence, like doing RAG and or extracting information from PDFs, we're using something called document intelligence. Azure AI also has um, Azure Search AI or AI Search. It does, you can upload collections of documents and uh, do the same kind of thing. 
so that's just a really brief overview of our technical architecture. There was a, a question about API access. API access is the most requested feature we've gotten from our research community. Uh, in terms of the cost question that we got about it, we envision uh, probably uh, no costs, like starter amount of API usage you can have. And then after that, we would have to go to a recharge model for the, for the costs. Um, next question is, what are your thoughts on OpenAI releasing their own canned white label, you know, name of UC GPT apps? Um, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, we would be, we would be excited to partner with open AI on such a venture. Uh, it's just that in the conversations we've had with them, open AI's, open AI's model is so cost prohibitive that I would never, I, I don't see how we bridge that gap in the current budget climate on like an enterprise deployment slash like partnership on making that something that could be deployed. I, I see their position and system is more as there will be specific use cases or there will be um, research units or admin units that have the funding available for usage there, but any sort of like vision of having a Gen AI license for open AI in every hand on, on a campus is, is just, I think we calculated for ourselves at UCI would be to the tune of at their current pricing, uh, it'd be like $1.2 million a month, which is just, and that's before API usage, any of the additional features, that's just straight access. Uh, that's not a budget hit that we can currently take. But I'll just add to that. If there is some commercial product that comes along and offers a you know a low cost option that does general purpose, you know, generative AI, kind of similar to chat GPT, I think that'd be pretty, pretty cool. I'm honestly, for from my perspective, it'll let us kind of focus more on university specific problems. You know, uh, there's a lot of problems that we've, we've talked to a lot of people um, and they like to leverage generative AI for their specific use case. So like Scholar Connect was like one thing that is definitely in the, the higher ed space. It solves a problem for UCI. I mean, there's not going to be a commercial, a general purpose commercial offering that, that will solve that necessarily. So I think it'll just let us uh, focus more on solving specific university problems. Yeah, another consideration we had when we designed SawGPT chat was we wanted the backend LLM to be modular, something we can either add to or take in and out. Uh, you know, Gen AI has come a long way in the last 12 months. What the landscape looks like today will be potentially a lot different 12 months down the line. And so we wanted the opportunity to be able to uh, have a platform where we can integrate other LLMs. Uh, and even right now we have the ability to choose different LLMs within ZotGPT chat between GPT three and a half and four. Um, you know, should the future, should the market change and GPT, chat GPT and open AI no longer be the market standard, um, we have the ability to fairly easily change out the LLM on the back end that is used. Yeah, one thing we're really interested in is um, Amazon Bedrock, which is kind of a, they'll, they'll run your LLMs for you. Um, open source LLMs. So they have uh, um, Claude, uh, Anthropic Claude. They have, I don't think they have Llama 3 yet. I have to, to double check, but they have a number of other models that they, they support there. Uh, so ZotGPT has a dropdown so you can choose the model, but right now it's just, um, it's just GPT 3.5 or 4. We want to add to that list. And I think it'd be really great if we can add some of the bedrock models to that as well. Yeah, so uh, we got a question of her adding an AI literacy course. This is as well to all student majors uh, from all students from all majors. Uh, we're advocating for one, but having a course added is a very lengthy and, and complex road. So it's it's the very early stages of those conversations. I would expect something aimed first at the faculty and staff. Uh, we would I probably envision a world where our office of the vice provost for teaching and learning uh, they do like. Uh, they do days, they do uh, like instructional design days before every academic year begins for faculty and anticipate some sort of cohesion there. Uh, for the faculty and staff, uh, we're hoping that our BSA and our team could begin to put that, uh, that training stack together. Uh, and then later on down the line, uh, hopefully in a couple of years, we'd have something where uh, it's like you have to come to our SBOP, which is like our orientation for students. Like we would have something about Gen AI in there. Somebody had a great question about, um, I think it's related to the Gilman chatbot 
for, for Chancellor Gilman's course. And if we've given any thought to uh, making this available to other instructors and kind of what are the cost considerations there? So yes, absolutely. Like Chancellor Gilman, that'd be, we want to focus on like getting this up for, for his course, ideally in the fall. But the idea is that we want to do it in a way that's where we can replicate. We can stamp these out for additional instructors if, if they, they have the need. So the, the way we're looking at this is we have a roadmap for ZotGPT chat and we have a number of enhancements we want to make like um, you know, training it on training it on uh, lots of documents. We want to offer conversation sharing so you can open up a conversation with maybe all of your students. Like there's a lot of different building blocks that once you put them all in place, um, we have a bot that, that potentially instructors can use that does all, all of the things that like the cha Chancellor Gilman chatbot could do. So yeah, I think that's the direction we're heading. Uh, this, is, this would be just like the first pilot and um, from there, hopefully we can expand it to other instructors as well. A democratizing like your own custom GPT creation is one of our, if not the primary goal of, of our group. Uh, we've gotten so many use cases that are originally we had thought, well, maybe we wipe love as many as we can. And there's the number of different use cases is so high that we would never be able to meet them. So sort of a training the trainer model is is what we're going for and, and having the ability for anyone how to how to be simple where anyone uh, you know if you use the open ai backend to do custom gpts it's pretty straightforward uh, we're hoping to get to a similar spot with the gpt chat in the near future i have a question you had a slide about this at the very beginning of your presentation can you talk again briefly about the process it took for you to get to the point where you're able to launch something? I mean, you mentioned you had many, con you know, dozens and hundreds of conversations with folks and maybe what the, maybe, you know, who those stakeholders were and maybe what the biggest challenges were in, in, in getting there and, and to get to, to the point where you were able to launch this tool, because I think at Berkeley campus, we're still, we're still there a little bit. Yeah, for us, um, We've talked to several Senate faculty subgroups. Um, we presented to the provost's cabinet. Uh, I think one of the biggest challenges we faced were uh, no one on campus was sure who owned the decision on whether or not to launch. Uh, without any sort of formalized AI governance body on campus among, among you know senior senior management on campus, uh, every time we would ask, "So can we launch?" the question I wouldn't say go into a black hole, but there wasn't any certainty. There was no official person X over, you know, vice provost over area X or, um, you know, vice chancellor Y over area is, you know, or over this given area is the responsible party. Uh, we were fortunate in that we didn't meet any uh, like insurmountable concerns. The majority of the concerns we faced were for teaching and learning around academic integrity and honesty. Um, the second, layer of concerns we faced were from privacy and legal. Um, but we were fortunate in that our, our vice chancellor, uh, Tom Andriola, gave us air cover to um, for faculty and staff. He took ownership of the decision to launch there. Uh, we've been working with our vice provost for teaching and learning, uh, Michael Denon, for the student launch. Uh, we've had good support there. Um, along the way, we've had several checkpoint conversations um, I'm, I forgot what corporal stands for. Max, what corporal stood for, uh, but yeah. So there's there's there <laughs> are several, libraries and computing. <laughs> there we go. So there's there are several Senate subcommittees that that we presented to, like corporal. We presented to our um, assistant dean groups. Uh, we've been constantly in contact with the AI advisory group over vice over the vice provost for teaching and learning. Uh, Every conversation, one of the, I want to say one of the frustrations, one of the things we noticed was every time we'd have a conversation with someone, they'd asked if we'd talk to another work group. And so it was almost like the Ponzi scheme of like work group conversations, uh, where we eventually went back to our leadership and said, uh, we could have these conversations until 2020, you know, five if we wanted to, but at some point, like who's going to take ownership to launch or not. Um, and that's where we, you know, we had a conversation with, uh, with Michael Denon and, and, and Tom Andriola. And uh, basically, we were able to draw the line at one last conversation a couple of weeks ago with, uh, with one last faculty committee, uh, who then suggested we talk to like the graduate student committee as well. Um, but but that was we used as a good enough conversation point and support point to go ahead and launch more more broadly. 
And it's a lot of the same questions that you know we've we've been getting from you know during this meeting and, and other conversations about uh, technology and privacy policy and can anyone see this? You know what happens if um, an instructor comes to us and says, "I want to see the information that was put for you know that was sent to ZGPT chat um, by this student." Um, a lot of the very very same topics. So sorry. I'll just add. I'll add uh, something. So teaching and learning has probably been the the biggest, uh, the most consultation, I guess, that we, we've had we've had on on campus. But one of the big things that um, they were were supportive of and they're happy about was that we have a click through agreement for just for students. So when they log into ZGPD Chat for the first time, they get this click through where they read about you know it's a, it's about a paragraph long. So we didn't want it to be this long kind of like a license agreement or something like that. Very short. And they check a box that says, I, I agree and understand, and then they can use the tool. So we're trying to put something in place. So at least like they have to read something in order to get access to, to the tool. Certainly some students will just click through without reading it, but, but that was really important for our teaching and learning folks so that we can get the message to them that says, you know, make sure that this is something that is okay to use, that, that your instructor permits this kind of usage. And if you're not sure, talk to your instructor. I think that's the basic message they want to come across for students. Yeah, and other campuses have, have had similar policies. So I would say that we're AI supportive campus. However, when it comes to teaching and learning, ultimately what's on an instructor syllabus is what is the you know law of the land for that course. Uh, so a great question. So what was the most compelling argument we gave that got the green light? Uh, I would say it was twofold. One was the equity of access issue. Um, Again, there's lots of students at UC Irvine, as I'm sure there are at UC Berkeley, where $20 a month is no problem, but there's just as many, if not more, where 20 bucks a month times and number of services is a problem. So making the case that we were providing equity of access to these tools was a, was a great sell. Um, the second one was, um, if you're an instructor and we take the assumption that your students are using ChatGPT today or, or Gemini or Copilot today, um, that is your data that is university research data instruction data admin data going into publicly available models that are being used to train said publicly available models and being stored in server farms potentially in places that we don't want them stored that would be in violation of of university pre-existing agreements um, those two arguments combined i think were what got us over the finish line i know the equity of access arguments the one that resonated most with our provost yeah, so the way we look at it is the opportunity cost. If we don't launch, there are risks. If we don't launch, there are certainly risk, risks if we do launch. So you have to really balance those out and fully consider both sides. Because yeah, it doing, not not acting, definitely there's a lot of, there's a potential consequence there, or potential risk there. Thank you so much, Max and Sarkis. I think that might be a really nice place to end here and, and to contemplate those questions. And, um, and we really appreciate you coming to share your experience with our UC Berkeley AI community. And um, if you have any final thoughts, I open it to you now. And I will look at the chat to see if there's any final questions. I'll just add that if you're welcome to reach out to Sarkis and I. If if you have any questions about how we, how we implemented .gpt chat or how we overcame some of the, the hurdles, we'd be, be happy to, to chat more, but really appreciate all of your time. Thank you for inviting us. It's been, been a pleasure for us. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, this was a fantastic opportunity. We hope that everyone on the call found this insightful and uh, useful for the conversations happening at UC Berkeley. And if anyone has any additional questions or conversations they wanna have, uh, Max and I are available. Thank you so much. Thank you everyone for attending. We'll see you at the next meeting. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Thanks, Sarkis.